to kick off this series this morning called November Rain. And really the heart is, this was not planned, this wasn't structured. But how many of you know that sometimes God moves in the spontaneity of things? Even though we didn't plan it, God planned it. Even though we didn't purpose it, God purposed it. And so here we are, and I want to say right from the start, let's not just be here for this week or then three weeks from now. Can we just say, before we sort of wind down and get into holiday mode right around December, why don't we just give God these next five weeks and say, God, we want you to do what only you can do. We want to go into next year with a sweet spirit, with an open heart. And because next year is not just next year, next year is a new decade. And we want to walk into it fresh. And so this morning, I might preach a bit, then teach a bit, and then preach a bit, and then we will just land the plane wherever it lands, all right? Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, it says, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. I want to read one more passage of scriptures from Numbers 11. Numbers 11 verse 4, it says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense cravings, intense cravings. So that the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely. Remember those words, we ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Father, I pray that as we spend these moments together, that we would not just come around these scriptures and see it as an opportunity to think and understand what you have to say, but that this would be a prophetic moment that you would open our hearts, open our minds. Father, I take authority over every principality and powers of darkness that are operating that might sort of steal away what you have to drop in our hearts. And I take authority right now. The only spirit allowed in this room is your spirit, the Holy Spirit. And Father, we say, God, we don't wanna walk out from this place the same way we walked in. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. This morning, I read from two passages of scriptures, Joshua, and numbers and what you need to understand is that this passage of scripture has to deal with the same bunch of people uh, almost in the same geographical location but during a different moment in time they're not too many years apart but we can just see that there is something that is happening I, I think I need to give you a bit of a brief history and the history is the children of Israel signed up for a welfare program that went wrong with the Egyptians and 400 years later, those that were invited to the nation have now become slaves and they are being bound in slavery and God raises a leader called Moses. Uh, They call him deliverer, they call him savior, they call him the man that has just come out of nowhere and Moses miraculously within a span of few months, perhaps a year, delivers these guys from Egypt and he's taking them to a place called the promised land. I don't know if you know this, but this is a great picture, in many ways, a reflection of our lives because we were bound. We were born into a system that we did not ask for. We were, the Bible says that we, well, we, were, we, were, we were sinners. We were born in sin. It was not, no one taught us how to lie. No one taught us how to sin. No one taught us how to, I was talking to someone the other day and they said, I don't lie. I said, you do. I don't, I know I don't. Can I say to you, every person in this room lies. If you've ever ordered something online, if you've ever bought something on iTunes, if you have an Optus or a Telstra or whatever, do you know when they give the terms and conditions and you scroll all the way down and said, yes, I've read, that is a lie, my friend. You are a liar. There is a sin nature within us. I caught everybody right there. We're not going to argue variances, just that right there. And, 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 so, and so there is a sin nature. And so these guys were born in Egypt and God raises a man out of, literally out of nowhere called Moses. He delivers them. It is miraculous how you can, you can take two million people uh, out of their jobs and make it, a, make it a deal for the king of the land. All their laborers. And it, that's a perfect picture of Christ because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. In a moment, he came as a savior. He came as a deliverer and took us out of darkness 
into his life. But how many of you know that God did not just save us, but he's also called us. And so these were a bunch of people that had a calling. And I think there are so many saved people in the church, but there are too few called people in the church. But, and just like the, these Israelites had a promised land, God has a promise for you. And that could be whatever it might be. It could be walking in His will, walking in His ways, fulfilling the plans and the purposes that He has for you. It could look in many shapes and different sizes. But I think what happened in this journey is that these guys got so caught up in the way it happened or in the way it did not happen. And they start complaining about the, their diet. They, start, they, they saw incredible miracles. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw all these things happen, but this rebellious nature began to sort of come forth. And what happens is these people were saved, but they were bored. Have you ever felt saved and bored? It's like, I'm supposed to be excited. And I thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Moses, for saving me. But I'm bored. I'm just bored. And I'm looking everywhere else for other things that I can chew on. And, and, and that's exactly what, and, and this, this message is for you. If that's where you're at. And I think in all of our lives, there are areas when it comes to God, when it comes to faith that we are in the unknown. And so we can sort of get a bit bored. We might not categorize it as being bored, but there are behaviors that point towards that. And out of them being bored, they start complaining and they start saying, because God put them on a diet called manna. Now, I don't want to get into what that means, and, but manna was literally the food of heaven. God would rain down food from heaven every morning, every afternoon, every night. And so it was manna cereals for breakfast and manna salad for lunch and manna fest for dinner. And so <laughs> all, and, 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 and once you have like a few years gone, it's sort of like there's manna lattes now. And it's sort of like everyone is sort of like, I'm sick and tired of manna, which is understandable because we do get bored but what scholars teaches is that the manna that they ate was not just diet for their nutrition but it was actually that when the manna they ate when their bodies would would eject it when their bodies would sort of perspire what would happen was there were healing properties that came forth from the manna that the reason why the children of Israel were so healthy, the reason why their clothes did not tear apart, I don't know if you know this, the reason why their shoes did not go worn out was because of the diet they were on. See, some of us have been complaining about the same thing. And we've been complaining because we want something new and there is nothing wrong in wanting something new from God. But when we look backwards, when we look towards Egypt and start complaining and wanting the cucumbers that God saved you from, then there's a problem. See, for some of you, the manna is not manna, but for some of you, that manna might be a mentor. That manna might be a scripture. That man, manna might be a way of mindset that God is wanting you to walk in to enter into the promises that he has for you. That manna might be consistency. That manna might be worship. That manna might be just things that you've sort of shied away from. But friend, I want you to know that even though manna seems boring, there is strength in the manna. There is fulfillment in the manna. There is nourishment in the manna. And there are times and seasons even in our, in our following of Jesus that we don't fully see the clear picture of what he has for us. But can I say to you, never look back and start talking about the cucumbers that God saved you from the part that God has put you on is not just for your nourishment but also for your sustenance the manna is important we need to ask the question as followers of Jesus what are we craving I find people that tell me things like oh, I used to be on fire for God but 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 it's just not there and, and, and we, we have these unknowns that we put out there. But the truth is, if that is not filling you, there is actually something else that's filling you. I think the question we should not be, the, the thing, the statement we should not be saying is we've lost our fire. I think the thing that we should be asking is where have we put our fire? Where have we put our faith? Where have we put our focus? Where have we put our joy? Where have we put our desire? And you got to understand that there were two leaders that I'm pulling forth from Scripture. One leader was Moses and the second leader was Joshua. See, Moses rescued the Israelites from slavery, but it was the leadership of Joshua that conquered the slave mindset in them. See, God can save you from your past, but only you are the one that presses the delete button on your past. God can save you from Egypt, but it's you that's got to make the choice to say, I don't want that in my memory. I don't want that in my mindset. I don't want that, any, any of that to feed me. And that is only you that makes the choice. See, Moses was the deliverer, but Joshua was the conqueror. 
And I don't want a church that's just full of people that have been delivered from sin. I want a church that's full of people that have conquered their sin so that they can walk into their calling and they can walk into their promises and they can walk into where God has called them to be. And can I say, if last night was horrible and last week was horrible, there's always grace and there's always mercy. But that's only one dimension of what God has for you. Don't just follow the leadership of Moses. Let's say when I'm going into 2020, I want to put on the mantle of Joshua. I want to take on some cities. I want to take on some promises. I want to take on some things that God has for me. Over the next five weeks, I'm praying that some of us will begin to recognize what are the things from our past that we've been craving. Because unless we understand that, we will not understand where our appetite lies. See, because some of us have been struggling with stuff, not for one month, but maybe a year, maybe 17 years. I do not know, and I want to say this, and really this is on the onset. Usually we come to church to hear something positive, and I promise you, if you stick long enough, you will hear something encouraging and strengthening and faithful. But I need you to understand that the battle that you and I are facing is not against people and, 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 and stuff like that. The ba- battle that you are, and I are facing is against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. And I, I need you to understand that there is someone called the enemy, and he has a name. He's not your neighbor. His name is Lucifer. His name is the devil. There is someone called the devil. And, 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 and the thing about the devil is he lies to us. He makes it sound like free. Why don't we put up verse 5 from the book of Numbers. Verse 5, it says, look at all the food. We remember the fish. This This is what stood out to me, which we ate what? Freely. Are you kidding me? They're making you work 20 hours a day. You call that freedom? See, the devil has a way of saying that he provides freedom, but actually what he provides is bondage. What he provides is an incredible amount of addiction to that stuff. It feels like freedom. It's packaged as freedom, but let me tell you, it will own your life. The only freedom you can really find is in Christ. And this series is about some of us experiencing freedom in our lives. God did not just save us to keep us bound. He saved us to set us free. He that the Son sets free is free indeed. And I want, I want, I want you to get an appetite and I want you to get a faith that says, I want to walk in freedom. I think the reality we need to accept this morning to really set the premise for this series is demons are real. Not to freak you out. And one of the greatest strategies of the devil is to fool people into thinking that he doesn't exist. See, here's the funny part. The devil actually doesn't need you to have faith in him. See, God requires us to have faith in him for him to move. But the devil actually does not need you. He's completely opposite. He does not want you to have faith in him and that's when he begins to move more. And so you got to understand that he is real. But the thing is, when we think about the devil, we have got all these made up ideas about the devil. We think it's this guy running around with a pitchfork and a red underwear. Like, you know, <laughs> we, have like, we, have all these, like, we have all these images in our heads. Understandably, if you've read any sort of book, seen any sort of stories, it's all that. But we need you to, I need you to understand that the devil has two groups of people that he categorizes as his favorites. The first group of people that he categorizes as his favorites are the skeptics. Not the atheists, the skeptics. Because there are even skeptics in the church that don't know who he is or don't know the reality of him or even don't know his influence. And you gotta understand that, that you know, the first group is the, those of us that are skeptics, that there is no attack. That the devil, he ain't real or he's retired. He's on super at the moment. Like, you know, it's all running dry. Like, there's this mindset, but Peter warns us. Check out what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8. He says, uh, it says, be sober. That's a good word right there. That's another message. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a div- roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Peter is pointing to the church and he's saying, be vigilant, be aware. He does not say be full of fear. He does not say be freaked out. He does not say don't give, he does not say to give him any glory. He does not say to give him much airtime, but he does say be aware. And we got to be aware. Then there's the other side of the fence. So we've got the skeptics that are sort of completely unaware or living in denial. Then you've got the other side of the fence. fence. You've got the superstitious. And the superstitious believe that everything's a demon. I was late this morning because the devil didn't warn me. No, you slept in. Get some discipline. 
and the superstition is bl- the superstitious is blaming everything. And I think the best example I can give you is I believe in Luke, uh, I believe it's Matthew 4, Luke 4, where Jesus is on a fast. He's on a 40 day fast, if you know the story. And as he's fasting, he's, a, he's on the 40th day, and the Bible says that he became hungry. And then it says the devil came and tempted him. Now, if a superstitious person read that story, they would read it as the devil made him hungry. So you should not hunger. If you're fasting and you're hungry, demons are attacking. If you're fasting and you're hungry, it's because you're human. Praise God. (laughs) And so now the devil came and attacked, but he will attack regardless of what our cravings are. So you got to understand there are two uh, elements to it. You've got the skeptics and you've got the superstitious, but I think you've got, there's a middle ground here where we've got to be aware and we've got to be conscious that there is an enemy out there that's out there to kill, steal, and destroy. One of the questions that I get asked quite, not so frequently, but it's one of the hot topics, is can a Christian be possessed? Can a Christian be possessed? Uh, I, think, I think when I get asked that question, mostly it's in a coffee shop or it's in a different forum. It's like, that is such a multi-layered question that I cannot answer that in, in that dimension, but I'll try to answer that. But I think what we need to understand is that before we answer the question of can a Christian get, 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 get de- possessed, what we need to ask is we underestimate the depth and breadth of the freedom that Jesus died to purchase. I think that's what we got to understand, that just like the children of Israel were set free from the hands of the Egyptians, they were still not where God needed them to be. And you got to understand that the the freedom that Jesus died for you is multi-dimensional. And and certainly Jesus has set us free from guilt and shame. Yet what you got to understand is that there are dimensions of freedom that we overlook. And that's why you got to be here next week. We're going to talk about different signs and elements of freedom. That's why I need you to be be planted and be plugged in and stay tuned so that God can do His work in you as the Word is spoken. You've got to understand that we may be born again, we may be Word-filled, we may even be called to ministry, but it does not automatically mean that we're going to walk in all the freedom that Jesus has provided for us. And part of our understanding of demons is, God, I blame Hollywood for it. Because the moment you, 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 you say the word demon possess. We get imagery in our head of a girl turning her head backwards or we have images of someone, a man looking in the mirror and seeing another face. That happens to me most Mondays, by the way. But <laughs> who is this man? <laughs> but, but, you know, we have all these images when it comes even to the word demon possessed. We have all these associations. We've got pictures playing in our head from the movies that have educated us. Another problem that we have in understanding these words, demon possessed, is, is what the actual word, I think is going to come up on the screen. There it is, demon possessed, is, is what it means in the Greek. In the Greek, the word demon possessed, the original Greek word is daimono zome. Daimono zome. I'm going to break this down. We're going to teach for a few seconds. Uh, we're going to go from here. But daimono zome. And daimono stands for demon. And zome is translated as possessed. But in English, when we hear the word possessed, we understand it to be as owning something. That house is under my possession. That car is under my possession. That MacBook's under my possession. It's under, but in Scripture, the word zome, that word possession, is used in few places. It's used in a few instances, but it's used for good and bad places. So it's a neutral word. Just the context changes it around. So one of the examples I want to share is Luke 21. Jesus is having a conversation. And check out what it says. Luke 21, 19. It says, by your patience, possess your souls. By your patience. So the context is Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he's saying that you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be tested. Uh, your parents are going to disown you. Your brothers and sisters are going to be mad at you for the gospel. And, and, and you're going to be tested. And then he says, by your patience, possess your soul. Now. When Jesus says those words, possess, the same word possess there is used for the same word being demon possessed. Are you with me? Now, is Jesus saying possess your soul in terms of own your soul? He's not saying that. Because our soul, those of us that are followers of Jesus, our soul belongs to God. So Jesus is not saying possess your soul. He's actually saying when you're going to be trialed and when you're going to be tested, you may get angry, you may get mad, but allow patience to permeate your soul. 
to possess your soul. Allow patience to influence your soul. Are you with me? And so all of a sudden, then it changes the whole conversation because the word demon possess is heavy loaded. It gives us all these red flags and vibes. And, but we've got to understand scripturally, demon possess means to gain influence over. To gain influence over. Some Christian teachers teach that Christians cannot be influenced by a demon because the Holy Spirit lives in them. And can I say, even the movement that I'm a part of, we are divided on this. There are some pastors that believe that, you know, you can't and there's theology around it. But I want to I talk. I, I want you, I want, you know, because a cool thing they say is, if God is living inside a person, how can a demon reside there or even gain an entry point? Now, I want to break this down to you. Scripture, is this okay? You're still tracking? Yeah. Scripture, scripture teaches us something about the nature of God. We know that God is what? Omnipresent. What that means is God's everywhere. He's like endless Wi-Fi, <laughs> available at all times. He's everywhere. You know, be it in the bedroom, be it in the bathroom, be it in your living room, be it in church. He is everywhere. He's omnipresent. So he will never leave us, nor forsake us. So if God is omnipresent, in fact, David says, if I make my bed in the Hades, if I make, make my bread in, bed in darkness, you will be there. There's a whole scripture that he talks about. So if God is everywhere, no matter what valley you're in, no matter what dry places you're in, God is still there. So if God is everywhere in this planet, Where's the devil? If God is everywhere, and if the theologians say that God and devil cannot coexist, where is the devil? Are you, are you understanding? So then that tells me that if God lives in our bodies, there are spaces and places in the complexity of our creativity and our makeup that the devil can occupy. That's what it means. And so we gotta, we got to understand, see, we got to understand. Now, before I say this, I need, to, I need to share this, that a Christian cannot be owned by a demon, but a Christian can be influenced by a demon. And that's just bad. Like, why are we waiting for him to own us? Like, if, if there's an influence, I want to get that stuff out. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to categorize my level of how much demonic influence I have. If there's even an ounce of it, I want it out. I don't want it to influence me. I don't want it to impact what God has for me. I like how one Greek scholar puts it. This is the whole premise of my message. I love how one Greek scholar puts it. One cannot speak of a person being possessed by a demon. A more appropriate expression may be the person possesses a demon. Changes everything, doesn't it? It's not so much about that owning me. It's about if I've made room for it, that I own it. And, 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 and I want to sort of share probably two stories to really help break this down because this morning what I really want to set to you up is to go and ask the Holy Spirit, God, is there places in my life that I need to surrender? That's my message. If you're a bottom line person, I'm giving you the bottom line. Are there places in my life that are not under your lordship, that, are not, that is not under your leadership, that I need to surrender? Now, I want, you, I want you to picture this. Let's say you're at home and you start hearing some noises. Maybe outside, maybe demand, don't know what kind of your home environment is. Maybe it's a sort of you've got a walk area, but you've got this random person. You know that this person is, 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 is a thief, you know, uh, you know, he's got the attire, he's got the look, he's got a mask, he's got some sort of weapon to take care of situations. And, and so you see it, what are you going to do? Your first response is not going to be, oh, he's just outside. Your response is going to be, hey, I'm going to watch that. And probably you're going to warn some of your friends in the neighborhood, or you're going you're to call somebody. You're going to call the cops. You're going to say, hey, there's someone. You're not going to go, oh, he's not coming to my house. Or let's say he's coming to your house and like, oh, he's just in the storeroom. He's just in the garage. Like there's nothing important in the garage. He's not coming to the living area, so, you know, he's not taking the plasma yet, so it's all good. You know, we're not going to operate that way, right? We're going to right away, we're going to go get out of this place. We're going to self-defend. We're going we're gonna to first think out what are the steps. Can I take this guy down on my own, <laughs> or am I going to get some backup? We make an assessment, don't we? We, never, we would never leave a window or a door open and say, oh, yeah, let him just sneak in. Let him just, you know, just chill out for a bit and then go on his way. But that's exactly what we do. When it comes to the devil, there's a little window, a little door. The Bible does not call him the devil. The Bible also calls him the thief. The thief, that tells me there are attributes of the enemy that behaves like a thief. The thief doesn't enter through your door. He enters through a window. He enters through a crack. And my question to you this morning is, is there a crack 
that is open in your life that the enemy is going to come in to kill, steal, and destroy what God has for you, the promises that he has for you. Are you with me? We've got to understand that our compromising lifestyle is a direct invitation to the thief. And I, we just need to ask ourselves, and can I say when I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me, and I'm asking God, is there any place in my life where there is compromise? Is there any mindsets? Are there any thoughts that, that is living in compromise? Because I don't want to make room for the enemy. I want to share one more story. Let's say a Christian, I've got a prop here to help really drive this thought home. Uh, I, I wanted to go all out, but I'll just stick here. I was going to get something a bit more stronger than water, but I didn't want to lead anyone into temptation. And Peter said to us to be sober, so we will leave it at that. But let's say, amen. So let's say, <laughs> let's say, uh, let's say, let's say there's a Christian, a Christian lady, uh, she drinks, she's drinking and she drinks a bit too much that, that night and she gets a little bit drunk. And let's say she goes for a drive, shouldn't be. She goes for a drive and tragically a ha an accident happens. Let's say the person that she crashes into dies or is in a bad state. And, 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 and the question I want to ask you is, when that Christian lady was drunk, did God own her? Before you answer, the answer is yes. She belonged to God. But when they write the police report, they don't say Christian lady. They say woman under the influence. See, you can be Christian and still be under the influence. And, I, and the question I'm not asking about is, is your faith in God? Are you saved? Are you not saved? That's not the point. The question is, is there an area of my life that is under the influence of the enemy? Is there an area in my life that I haven't surrendered to? Because it's amazing how this lady is Christian, but the moment she came under the influence, that dictated all our habits that dictated all her behaviors. That, di that dictated all her mindset. And that is exactly what sin does. You know the sin that you think, or oh, no one's getting hurt. You think that. But as that grows in your life, that'll affect the way you think. That'll affect the way you text. That will affect the way you interact. Even without you knowing subconsciously, your spirit being is being submitted to this thing as you are coming under the influence. Are you with me? And so we got to ask the question, am I under the influence? Is there any area of my life that I'm under the influence of the enemy? And that's why I love this series because we are making it a declaration as a church. We are saying that in November, we are saying we don't want to stay under the influence of any other spirit apart from the Holy Spirit. And what I love is if you, if you read the story, if you read once again, why don't we put Joshua chapter 3 where that passage of Scripture, this is where the hope comes in. It says, and, the, and Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourself. See, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. See, we want God to do wonders. We want God to take us into the promised land. I want you to notice before Joshua ever occupied Jericho, the first city. Here's the crazy part. God promised Jericho not to Joshua, not to Moses, but to Abraham. But they lived so long in passivity and in just, oh, thank you, God. But there was a moment where Joshua said, enough is enough because God is about to do wonders. And, and, but, but before God can do the one, in fact, my message is called bring on the wonders. I'm saying, God, in 2020, bring on the wonders. I want you to do some signs, wonders, and miracles in my family, in my church, in my home, in my business. Bring on the wonders. But before God can do, there is a prerequisite, and that requisite is sanctify. I know it sounds old school, but it's still relevant. We can get as modern as we want, but we still need to clean the dishes in the 21st century. And in the same way, God still needs to cleanse us. God still needs to purify us. God still needs to set us free. And the word sanctification is the word there is separation. See, God is calling us to a place of preparation. But you need to understand that separation is a part of preparation. It's saying, God, I want to separate myself. 
I want to separate my family. I want to separate my thoughts. I want to separate my habits. I want to separate, you know, as Paul says, when I was a child, I behaved like a child. But now that I'm an adult, I'm called to a place of maturity. Church, this is what I believe God is saying to us in 2020. Now we behaved as a child. In 2020, he's calling us to a place of maturity because he says, I've got cities for you. I've got nations for you. I've got towns for you to conquer. But I need a holy generation. I need peace. People that are sanctified, people that are called. Church, I want you to sign in and say, I'm going to be a part of this. This is, not, this is not a good, just a message to make you feel good. I'm speaking vision into the next four weeks. I'm excited as Pastor Sam and Pastor Shane and Pastor Tim comes. I don't want just the sanctification to happen. I want wonders to break forth. I want wonders in your vision. I want wonders in your dreams. I want wonders in your families. Let's let God do the wonder thing. Let's get God do the wonder thing. He wants to do the wonder thing. And he's saying, if my church could just say, this is my moment and I'm willing to be surrendered, I'm willing to be sanctified, I'm willing to come before God and say, God, I need you to purify me. It's powerful what happens when we say, God, we want you to move in our lives. I want you to prepare your hearts. I want you to sh say, God, I, I, and this is the thing. The thing about this is it's not about me praying for you. This is about you praying for yourself. This is about you saying, God, I, I need to be, I need to be that person that is not under the influence of the enemy. I need to be that person that says, God, I need to surrender. I need to submit. And can I say over the next few weeks, there's going to be opportunity for prayer. We're going to pray for people, pray with people. But this morning, I just want you to recognize. And I just wanted you to submit. And I just want you to go before God. This is between you and God. And you saying, God, is there an area in my life that I need to surrender? Is there an area in my life that I need to submit? As I was preparing this message, I was worshiping God. And there was a passage, there was, there was, a, there was a song that just kept uh, repeating in my mind, repeating in my heart. And it's an old school song. And the song is Spirit of the Living God. Fall afresh on me. Spirit of the Living God. Fall. That's our prayer. Fall afresh on me. Melt me. Mold me. Fill me. Use me. See, the children of Israel under Moses just kept chasing, just kept wanting, just kept complaining. But the children of Israel under Joshua said, use me. See, Moses got them out of Egypt, but Joshua got Egypt out of them. See, God can get you out of the world, but only you need to make the choice to say, I need to get the world out of me. I need to change that way of thinking. I need to change that way of talking. I need to change that way of behaving. I need to change that way of texting. I need to stop sending subliminal messages so that somebody else can read it in my story. I need to just stop doing that. What? Why are we stopping the wonder? Because God wants to do wonders. Let me tell you, when you surrender, it is amazing what He begins to do on the inside. Why don't we stand up? I've asked if He could just quickly sing.